Welcome to the Talberg Foundation podcast series, New Thinking for a New World. Host Alan Stoga welcomes leaders from around the world to explore the issues that are challenging and changing their societies. From climate change to democracy under siege to geopolitics and beyond, we are looking for ideas that can make all our lives better. My guest today is Pascal Lamy, former Director General of the WTO and EU Trade Commissioner. Even those positions dramatically understate the role he has played and continues to play in trying to push Europe and the world, really, towards a fairer, more robust, more sustainable economic reality. Part of that effort is an amazing new book that he co-authored with Nicole Nesoto, titled Strange New World, that opens with this quote from Antonio Gramsci. The crisis consists precisely in the fact that the old is dying and the new cannot yet be born. In this interregnum, a great variety of morbid symptoms appear. That certainly sounds like today. So welcome, Pascal. Thank you for joining us. A pleasure. A pleasure to be with you. In Strange in a World, you make an elegant case that the world's a mess and that Europe has a unique role to play in fixing what's broken. I don't want to dwell today on those morbid symptoms. We'd all get way too depressed. But I want to focus on the second part of the equation. Why Europe? Well, it's not just because I'm a European uh, and I've served the French Republic for some time, the European institutions for some time, a global institution like the WTO for some time. But I think if I take the cockpit view of this planet, recognizing that we are globalized, but that the model of globalization which dominate this world is probably, at least in my view, not the right one. The model I would like to promote for this century of globalization would resemble more the European sort of vision of what civilization is than the American one or than uh, the Chinese one to take these two examples. I think by tradition, by history, by culture, by philosophy, uh, the model of the way of life in Europe is in a way better for people better for nature, at least in the concept we have of what's good and bad, than in the rest of the world. And I think if we are looking, which is my case, uh, for a more sustainable, environmentally, economically, socially, major economic model, it should resemble the European one. I'm not saying at all that it is perfect, but I still believe that in this planet, people looking at where life is better or less bad than elsewhere still think Europe, and I would like this to be the case uh, for my grandchildren and their children. You write in the book and you've just articulated what you call civilized globalization. It is a long tradition in France to think of its mission to civilize at a global scale. Is this sort of a 21st century evolution of that concept? What, what, what would civilized globalization look like if you had a magic wand and could make it happen? Well, that's a good question because uh, when, I, when I pass my exam, at the European Parliament to become a a European Commissioner on Trade in 1999, I coined an expression uh, which since then has floated in various uh, circumstances and uh, circles, which was, I wish, a more harnessed globalization. 10 or 20 years later, I switched to more civilized globalization while recognizing that harness is more modest than civilized and that you know the notion that our duty is to civilize the world is a bit of an old colonial uh, Kipling uh, mantra uh, with a 
smell of arrogance. <laughs> I totally, I totally accept this criticism. But what I mean by a more civilized globalization, in the sense that civilization is something that softens the violence in we have in each of ourselves as individuals, or which there is in the societies we build, civilization is taming violence. This is what I mean by civilization, and I wish a world where there is less violence, less damage, less stress on both humans and nature. My magic wand um, is very simple. I wish the people of this planet to be less stressed, less alienated, with either by poverty or by political power or by injustice. And I also want, <laughs> with my magic wand, uh, to make this planet more sustainable and to get uh, to a world that would be uh, decarbonized in uh, 2060. And I take this horizon because, as we know, this is the new Chinese one. And uh, I think that's what we should do. Certainly the Anglo-Saxon version of globalization puts financial at the forefront. The European version of globalization puts finance further back in the row, I think. And is that what you have in mind? Is it about trying to put people first uh, and perhaps the money second? Uh, that, that's a simplistic interpretation, but I want to push a little bit in the practical means of how do you humanize, how do you humanize globalization? Well, I, to answer frankly your question, we live in a global market capitalist system. Of course, there are different versions of that. The Chinese one is not the American one, which is not the European one, which probably will not be the African one uh, 30 or 40 years from now. So it's global, it's market, it's capitalist. I would decapitalize a bit the system. I would keep it global because there are immense benefits, although seriously, serious costs for some. I would keep it market, not for everything, because markets have their formidable efficiency, they also have their limits, but I would decapitalize it, i.e. give to the sort of financial side of this, uh, the sort of notion that if you don't get a return on your money of 10%, uh, you're uh, not right. I would try to change this. And there are many ways to change this. Regulation is one. Uh, putting uh, whatever uh, carbon price at the right level is one. Uh, putting the risk at the right level is one. And I think we started doing a bit of that after the 08 crisis. So it's, it's, it's in a way introducing precaution. More than what we've done, I like risk. I like innovation, I like competition, but I think precaution should sometimes prevail when it's about harming people, when it's about harming nature, or when it's about a financial system that gets a lot of return on a lot of risk, which then when the thing explodes, we all have to cope with. Which would be a dramatic evolution of what we have today, for sure. You, you are critical in various parts of European leaders in the past of, of not playing that role. There's a wonderful quote, Europe has been too absent. Uh, and I would agree with you, Europe has been too absent. But what is it in the current constellation of forces, not the demand, but the constellation of forces that suggests to you that Europe is ready, ready to arm itself and play the role that you like to see Europe play? Well, this book was written before the European elections of 2019. At the time, we were with the Juncker Commission, with this sort of a duopoly, which was organized in the European Parliament between centre-right and centre-left, Christian Democrats and Social Democrats. Uh, this has changed. 
What makes me think my dream of Europe stepping in more into this global role is that following the European elections, which reshuffled the map of political forces within the European Parliament, which led to the election of a new commission, which took as a strategic axis what we call in Europe now the Green Deal, what we should do is embark on this formidable transformation which decarbonization and digitalization imply for our economies, for our world. And I think the European roadmap is the right one. And I've not said that all the time. I think the, the direction is the right one. Then there is the question of whether uh, the European Union uh, is ready to uh, up its international game. And it's, uh, in my view, to try to answer your question uh, precisely, uh, it's a question of whether we have the three ingredients of global influence, namely weight, ambition, and know-how. This, I think, is the real equation. Weight was, we have a problem with uh, Brexit. The UK is 15% of the European economy, but in terms of weight of the European Union, it's probably like 25 or 30%. And that's a big problem because losing so much weight when your ambition is uh, to uh, up your game is a serious problem. Uh, and that's a big question mark. How can we compensate this weight? And we know, anybody doing sports knows that compensate a lot of weight uh, is about gaining muscle. Now, second, do we have the ambition? And this is the muscle. I think it's coming. Uh, if I read uh, the European mantras, if I read the European discourse, if I read uh, the European Council declarations, which are declarations, but which give a sense of where European politics are going, this notion that uh, we have to increase our strategic autonomy in order to be able to protect Europe from crisis, which, to be frank, mostly came from the outside. So the ambition is there, I think. And then the uh, capacity, the know-how is coming slowly, although although uh, I don't think uh, you can have uh, weight, uh, ambition and know-how without a better, stronger European economy, which as we know has been lagging behind the rest of the world uh, for the last 10 or 15 years for lack of innovation. Uh, so I see and I think the signals are there that the direction is okay, that the ambition is now there. Remains to see uh, whether we line up the sort of resources and that's the big challenge for the years to come. If one were to look at the EU from outer space, over the course of the last period, you would have seen the map change as you added in the East and dropped in the West. The UK is gone, but you've acquired as part, as integral parts of the EU, Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, etc. That's a dramatically different political space than you had to work with. It's your weight point. As the center of gravity in Europe shifts eastward, and we're watching the struggles over the budget exactly today, um, how do you think that ends up? How does the new Europe without the UK and with Eastern Europe playing a role it's never played, certainly not in the modern period? Well, I think the addition of uh, Eastern Europe after the fall of the Berlin Wall started a process uh, which is uh, still in the making. I don't think the belonging of these countries to the European Union, I don't think the view they have of 
why they should be part of the European Union and where the EU should go is for the moment aligned with uh, more traditional members like Germany, like France, like uh, Spain, like Italy, which are bigger economies uh, except for, for Poland. So I think it, it's a process which started with a huge enthusiasm, which then led to a sort of second generation reconsideration of ooh, ooh, did we really got out of Moscow's authority to fall under Brussels authority, which is, as you know, a classical populist theme, which has worked extremely well in, in Poland and in Hungary, uh, uh, not to speak about other countries, uh, which is why we have this problem with uh, democracy in Europe, uh, which in a way is totally unexpected. Now, had I been told 20 or 30 years ago that we would have a problem uh, with democracy in some countries of Europe, I would not have believed it. So this is the result of this ongoing process. I think at the end of the day, it will unfold properly because these countries belong geographically, historically, culturally to the European quote-unquote civilization. Uh, but it's, uh, it's a transition that still is not there. And Brexit, in a way, uh, makes uh, the European Union a bit less north and a bit more south. Uh, which, uh, as a Frenchman from the northern part of France, <laughs> I'm not sure <laughs> is the right thing to do. I've already dreamt my country to move uh, sort of 10 or 15 degrees latitude north uh, in order for public life to be uh, more disciplined, uh, for people not resisting paying their taxes, uh, for politics uh, becoming a bit boring. Uh, I recognize this is a typical Nordic version of what, <laughs> of what is the right thing to do. Uh, but I think the, the, this, this is a reality. We have to work with that, although, although, of course, I'm among those who believe that whatever the intentions of the Brexiters were, uh, they will not change, I think, the course of history, of geography, and that at the end of the day, there will be a political Brexit, but I'm not sure there will be an economic or a cultural Brexit which nuances the notion that we've lost them forever. You have a vision of Europe as a credible geopolitical power, which frankly, from my perspective, is desperately needed. But I wonder whether the citizens of the countries that make up the EU share that vision, or that's unfair whether enough of them share that vision. Is there a democracy issue, not just in the sense you've already mentioned it, but in the sense of that gap between a vision of Europe as a power, between Brussels as, as an effective governing authority in all its dimensions, and what the citizens that live in many countries still want? Or is that, is that just, is that exaggerated from a distance? No, I think, I think you're right. Although, and, and we have this problem of a discrepancy between economic integration and political integration. Uh, we have this sort of, what is called this democratic deficit, uh, which in my view is not so much in the kratos as in the demos. I think the democratic deficit is not a question of whether we have the right democratic institutions. I think we have them, and they are mirrored on a totally classical European parliamentary democracy system. I think we have a problem of a lower sense of belonging to this new political entity than a local, regional, or national belonging. And this will take a long time, because contrary to what the founding father thought, economic integration does not per se lead to political integration. There is a sort of barrier, a species between a happy consumer, a happy worker on the one side, and a happy citizen on the other side. And this necessitates quite a long evolution, which I think is taking place. And, and if I look 
at the rate of support for European integration on the continent, uh, it has increased uh, by roughly uh, 10% after the drop we had after the 08 crisis. And the responsible for that are one Brexit, two Mr. Trump, three Mr. Putin, fourth Mr. Erdogan, and fifth Mr. Xi Jinping. The reason why the support for Europe integration has increased recently comes from the fact that a simple consideration is that all the crises that have hurt Europe, that have damaged people's lives, employment, perspectives, whether it's the OIT crisis, uh, whether it's the migration crisis, whether it's the COVID crisis, have come from elsewhere, thus leading to a sort of consideration by the people that in this world, which is in a way threatening, and that's the lesson of recent experiences, the rest of the world is bringing us more bad than good. And I think little by little, this notion that some sort of what the French call sovereignty, and they love this world for cultural reasons, others try to translate into strategic autonomy, which is uh, a bit uh, vaguer, but is nicer for people who believe sovereignty is too aggressive. And then others add open to open strategic autonomy. I think when you see how the semantics are moving, I think we are getting to a stage where the willingness of the people to play that role, not so much to civilize the planet, but to avoid being decivilized is what's happening. Which is a perfect segue to my last question. In the world as it exists now, does that imply for Europe a balancing act somehow between two superpowers, China on the one hand and the US on the other? Obviously, that would be a dramatically different role than Europe has played since 1945. Uh, but it, it's almost implied in the way that you set up that last frame. If the problems are outside and you become a credible global power again, isn't that somehow in not opposition to, but as one of several global powers, as opposed to remaining as has been the case in the wake of a US-led alliance? Yes, to some extent. Now, yes, because we have an identity which is different from the US and different from China. We deeply differ from China for political reasons. We believe in democracy being the right way to address different individual preferences into a collective preference. We don't want this to be imposed. We don't want this to be secretly done. We don't want this uh, to be uh, to lead to uh, people losing their capacity to express themselves, their freedoms on the one side. So we have a huge difference. And we have a serious difference with the US, which is that we are more precautionist than they are, care more about nature. We believe that uh, the death penalty is the right, the wrong thing to do. We believe that holding firearms in your drawer is not prudent. We believe uh, that uh, energy systems uh, should be severely controlled. We believe that capitalism should be harnessed. So we have our differences. Yet, yet, we will not be equidistant from China and US. We won't be as aligned on the US as we were for decades for a variety of reasons. One of these reasons being that the US are now looking East Asia for a century. Uh, and that's not the tradition of the previous century. So we will remain different. We will not be equidistant, but we will be less aligned on the US than we've been. And I think the Trump experience, which 
thanks God, uh, already seems to look like a past experience, uh, will not fundamentally change this, although, although uh, we will probably will have a sort of better cousinage than uh, from uh, this crazy guy. Uh, I think the way to go is within this sort of corridor. I hope, I hope that again, we will get the necessary economic and political resources within ourselves to make this road, uh, which is a complex one, sustainable, knowing that the US-China rivalry is there uh, for the next uh, 30 or 50 years. Uh, this is unescapable. This will remain the vaccine of world geopolitics and geoeconomics. And in this context, we have to, in a way, fight our corner, in a way, for our interests and our values to remain an option for our grandchildren. I said that was the last question, but I lied. I have a, a coda. And the coda is this. Uh, to do what you've just described requires leadership. And I think you might share with me the observation that there has been a leadership vacuum uh, in Europe for some time. To go new places, to do new things, to build new capacities uh, requires leadership. Thank goodness you're providing intellectual leadership. Um, but where does the political leadership come from? Correct, correct. Uh, but this is uh, the necessary condition for this to happen is to get enough support in public opinions. If you are below the sort of 60% mark, it's not whatever charism, brio, that will address the problem of leadership. You have to be above the 60% mark on average on the continent, which is, by the way, where we are now. Now, then there is also an issue, which is that it's a bit Europe is not a federation. It's not a nation anymore. I mean, it's not just nations anymore. It's somewhere in between some sort of confederation, which implies a sort of collective leadership. And as you know, in politics, collective leadership is something which is difficult to communicate uh, because people want and like to identify with one person. And by the way, most of the political fight is about people saying, I am the one that you should recognize as your leader. I think we have to accept, and I know uh, it's, uh, it's a bit strange uh, in a French system, which is, uh, for me, I come from a system where the president is clearly the leader and the whole system is organized according to this. I think in the future, European leadership will resemble more a sort of Swiss system rather than a French presidential or American system. I think we have to accept that some sort of collegiality will have to be incarnated as a form of leadership. I frankly don't see, and I don't agree with those who say, oh, the right way to correct this democratic deficit is to elect a European president by universal suffrage. I don't believe one second this is the solution, not least because... <laughs> I mean, given the demographic ways, it's going to be a German because, because people will vote for what they know best, which is their proximity. So, yes, we have a problem with leadership, but this issue is more for European nations, in my view, to elect leaders who have a European vision and commitment and who collectively can drive the thing in the right direction rather than dreaming of some sort of a European uh, leader. I'm more thinking, I mean, in terms of historical references, it's more like uh, the Austrian-Hungary system or the Swiss system, uh, which are systems where leadership was not the first dimension of politics. But to your point, it probably requires thinking differently about leadership, thinking differently about institutions, um, and thinking differently about citizenship and the relation between citizens and those leaders.
Totally agree with that. Thank you very much for that because it is, it's a good place to stop because until we recalibrate what leaders are, what leadership is, we can't move on much of the agenda that you outlined. Well, the sun will come up tomorrow, Annie. That's a different point. Um, but we want more than that and deserve more than that. And I think the vision you've outlined is clearly much more than that. So now we need the leaders and the vision and the people to come together and thank you for what you're doing to define all that and, and to try to make some of it happen. So thank you very much for this conversation. My pleasure. And thanks for these uh, good questions, which are in a way familiar to me. And thanks for putting them so simply and uh, clearly. Thanks, Alan. And good luck to the Talberg Foundation. Thank you for listening to this episode of the New Thinking for a New World podcast. We welcome your comments on our website, talbergfoundation.org, and please subscribe to the podcast in the app of your choice. This podcast was made possible with the generous support of the Stavros Niarchos Foundation.